Now, out of touch, putting individuals at risk of harm and turning the clock back to the 1950s. That's what a cross-party group of MPs is claiming Universal Credit is doing. The benefit payment, which was introduced as one single payment to replace several others, is under the spotlight today in a report looking at how changing the way it's paid could impact on people who are subject to domestic violence. Well, the Work and Pensions Select Committee says the system can end up with abusers in charge of family finances, which can leave survivors and their children dependent on an abusive partner for all of their basic needs. Well, are they right? We can speak now to Frank Field, the MP who chairs the Work and Pensions Select Committee, which is calling for these changes. Also with us is Katie Ghosh, who is the chief executive of the charity Women's Aid. And also with us is Doris. That's not her real name. We're disguising her identity because she was in a relationship where she was financially reliant on a partner who withheld benefit payments intended for her children. Thank you all ever so much for being with us this morning. Frank Field, first of all, just explain for people watching, how is universal credit being paid and why is that a problem? Well, the benefit is rolling up six previous benefits into a single payment and it's paid to a single member of a household. Now what we don't know is whether that payment is going to the carer with children. In some instances it will be, but in some instances it won't be. And in some households it doesn't matter who it's paid to. So we're not saying this is a silver bullet, but we are saying that abusers will use controlling the money in a family to make their abusive powers even more stronger. So move one should be, given on universal credit forms, people tick who is the main carer, as the government's committed at the moment to single payments, they should make that single payment to the person who's ticked as care, the carer for children. And Obviously, so currently, just to be sorry, clear, because yes. people, who, yeah. it's so confusing, universal credit anyway. It is. To, <laughs> to be clear at the moment, who decides who that person is that gets paid? Is it the recipient or is it the government that decides which person in the household gets the money? Well, it's, it's part of a great mystery, that is. And what we're saying is uh, it may be satisfactory for many claimants. <clears throat> Nobody saw this problem coming up, so we're not blaming the government for it, but we're saying now it's been highlighted, please act. On the form, it, people tick who's the main carer. So you are now at the moment programmed to delivering only a payment to a single person in the household. In that, those circumstances, why not pay or please pay, not why not please pay, that payment to the person who cares for the children. Second, in the longer run, given that for you said that from the 1950s onwards, we tried to build up in the social security system an income as of right to people who care for children, overwhelmingly women. Now that is put at risk with universal credit, so we're saying in the longer run, we should be thinking about how we split this benefit to usually the, uh, uh, um, the, the carer, which is usually the mother with children, taking most of the benefit, and for, to the, uh, the male partner having part of the benefit as well. But in the meantime, they could actually act now to pay for those who care for children, taking the whole of the benefit, so that would prevent won't solve, uh, there's no silver bullet, it's a horrible, evil issue that we're dealing with, but it would actually momentarily strengthen the position of usually women with children who are abused. I want to bring in um, Doris at this point, um, and I know, Doris, that, that you work with a charity surviving economic abuse, and you spent well, more than 20 years with a partner who, you say he took away your independence, he made you financially reliant on him. Explain what happened. He did. I was quite young when I met him um, and I became pregnant very quickly um, and you don't realise the psychological manipulation that's going on and before you know where you are he was in control of everything um, so any benefit that was assigned was all in his name when uh, each time my ch children were born um, while I was still in the hospital he would be to hasty retreat to the town hall and register the births and, and submitted a claim then for child benefit and so that all child benefit was then paid to him as well. So he said he was the main carer? He did. Um, they wouldn't speak to me at child, in the child benefit centre at that stage because I wasn't the claimant. Um, 
and it just it was terrible i used to claim crisis loans almost every week because i didn't have access to any money even for things like sanitary towels and things for the children um and at one stage uh, one of the managers in the local dss um she she actually started crying she said i can't give you any more crisis loan it's okay take your time she just said, tell me you'll be okay. And I said, well, I can't do that because I didn't have any other support. Um, I'd been isolated from friends and family. Um, and then quite by chance, I heard about uh, a welfare benefits centre and went to see them. And they told me about a little known clause. I'm talking, it's 20 odd years ago, uh, that was in the legislation that if money that was being, being paid in benefits wasn't being used for the purpose for which it was provided, you could have that money separated off. So when I went to the DSS, they said they hadn't heard of it, but they did come back to me and, and they did split my payment. And then eventually I was able to claim, put child benefit back in my name. But it was very little money to live on. Um, I couldn't keep money in my purse because of this man. He, he'd he steal everything. He sold all any possessions that I had from around me. Um, it was really a difficult situation. And because there wasn't a safety net, I remained at risk. And I genuinely was in fear of my life um, and couldn't leave because I wasn't able to be economically independent. Um, I, as luck would have it, I worked hard and I studied and I was able to leave. Um, but the effects of that, there are long lasting effects of that and my children are affected as well. How are your children affected? Um, the, the, it, I suppose it's PTSD really, being made to stay in a situation where they're regularly abused. Um, I certainly have long-lasting health effects in that respect as well. And I think for the government, it's, it's, it is like they've gone back to the 1950s. It's appalling. So many years later, they are still coming up with the same tired old suggestions. They have no understanding about economic abuse. Um, the control that's exerted, it, it's, it's, it's terrible. You know, you, you, you actually think that you can't go anywhere, you can't do anything. Um, and that's the psychological stranglehold that men like that have over you. Um, you know, we're, we're keeping women in situations of risk that we're, we're just risking their lives and that's not being over dramatic. We're actually talking about women are made to stay and we know statistically that two to three women die every week as a result of domestic abuse. Um, it, it, I think the government, I don't know who they've consulted with on this, but I can't imagine it's with very many survivors. Um, well, that's what I wanted to ask Katie. I want to bring Katie in on this because it's so difficult to hear Doris's story. Are you hearing similar cases all the time? We hear cases like this all the time. Doris has described the devastating consequences on a whole family of financial abuse. Stranglehold is a very good word for it. The dynamics of domestic abuse are all about power and control. Our grave worry, which we've warned the government about from the beginning, is that universal credit hasn't been designed with the safety of survivors in mind. That has to change now. Single household payments are a problem when it comes to domestic abuse because you're giving a perpetrator the opportunity to take all the cash for themselves and exert more financial abuse over the victim. This isn't a problem, though, that is just of the making of universal credit. This has been there before, as Doris was pointing out, with, with child benefit. It was perfectly possible and still is perfectly possible for abusers to be registered as the main carer if they want you're, you to get the child benefit. You're absolutely right and that's why it's so good that the Frankfield's committee report has made some other practical recommendations to have a domestic abuse specialist in a job centre, to have a private room so that somebody who's suffering domestic abuse can talk to someone and we're really pleased that they've said they want training for all job centre staff developed with people such as ourselves who are specialists in domestic abuse can make a real difference. Job centre staff on the front line understanding the dynamics of domestic abuse just as Doris has described. Let me just read this to you, Frank Field, for, for exactly as you were saying there, Katie. Uh, the government 
has said we have specialist teams in every job centre who can support victims of domestic violence. Staff do everything they can to make sure people fleeing domestic abuse get the help they need as quickly as possible. And the vast majority of job centres have these private interview facilities and in the small number that do not, alternative arrangements can be made. Well, that's good progress. Um, um, but but we, we'll obviously find out how universal that service is and whether there are these separate rooms for people uh, to uh, any seek, uh, seek refuge really so they can lay out their case but nevertheless it comes back to this point although um, Doris's um, partner uh, went down and got hold of child benefit child benefit was not designed for him and he really had to move as Doris said fast and, and twist the law to actually get that benefit. That benefit was meant for her. What we're saying, move one, as you, you're only paying single payments to, um, to each month to a single person in the household, make that the carer of the children, move one. Secondly, we should obviously move, uh, when we've got experience where Scotland's experimenting on this, to split payments so the carer would have most of the benefit and the other partner would have an income in their own right. How but easy is it to do that though, to split those benefits? Because the whole point of universal credit was to make it easier so uh, one family wasn't getting six or seven benefits that were coming from different places. It was meant to make it simple and cheaper as well for well, the government to administer. Well we're doing, it's in two moves. It is going to a, a single payment so why not make that single payment to the carer of the children it's on the um, uh, universal credit form, so they got the information. They could do that, start doing that tomorrow. The second is the longer term uh, issue about how do we, through the social security system, give women greater independence who are caring for children rather than less independence. And we'll see how the experiments that Scotland wants to carry out on universal credit work, learn from that and hopefully move to a more complicated reform. But there's nothing stopping the government acting now to say we've only got a single payment system operating. We will now ensure that that single payment, the whole of it goes to the the carer with children. What do you, Doris, want to see the government do? I want to see se completely separate payments. I think split payments, is very little money is paid these days to people on benefit. And to split payments, number one, it's insufficient money. The abuser, the perpetrator, will never ever give any money into the household. And two, you're placing women at risk because if benefit is paid, if split benefit is paid, you are placing that woman at risk of violence from, because of the reaction that the perpetrator will have because they will lash out and it won't be on a one-off basis. Uh, my ex-husband works in an area where he gives welfare benefits advice and supports people making claims and appeals and he used, that, that, um, he used his knowledge to... Uh, to do what he did to us, uh, definitely split payments back, I mean it's going back at least 20, 25 plus years, I think that's old hat, I think there should be separate payments, I think once something should trigger when a woman approaches DSS and says I'm in an abusive relationship, I have no access to money or I'm in an abusive relationship and I want to leave, I need to leave because I'm afraid for my safety, that should trigger something with the Department of Work and Pensions. That's what we're really saying, Doris, that the split payment, you'd have it in your own right as carer with your children and there'd be another payment to the other person in the household. Katie, do you think this is being taken seriously enough by the government? It needs to be taken much more seriously. The government needs to take a long, hard look at universal credit through the lens of a survivor of domestic abuse. Safety first should be the principle. It's entirely possible to move over time towards a system of split or shared payments. The reason that's important and could work is if, if that becomes the default, the norm, then it means that it won't look unusual for that survivor to be requesting it. And that's exactly as Doris says, the worry at the moment, and I talk to survivors every day about this, they're worried that if they do the application to say, oh, by the way, could you split the payments, then the abusive partner will find out and they will punish them for that. Katie Ghosh, thank you so much from Women's Aid. Thank you also Frank Field, MP and Doris. Thank you so much for speaking to us, a survivor of domestic abuse.